you all here this morning. If you're like me, you're out of practice in terms of being in physical environments with other people and networking, so uh, I I'm slowly warming up to it again. It's been a while. Um, this is our second EPN that we've been here at Ohio State University. Um, one announcement just at the beginning, please limit your Wi-Fi use during the preparation for the live stream bandwidth and those watching remotely. So we're beaming this out this morning and we need to be able to sort of like um, um, as much bandwidth as we can to sort of make that happen. So appreciate that. Uh, before we begin today's program, I wanted to uh, share a little bit. Yesterday, the United States federal government for the first time recognized and celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day to honor the cultures and histories of the Native American people. This holiday has been honored by tribal nations and local communities and states across North America for decades. Our school holds great respect for the land and original peoples of the area where the Ohio State University campus is located. The land that Ohio State occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. The name Ohio itself is derived from Iroquois, Ohio, the Great River. The university resides on lands ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville and, for, and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. As we strive to honor the resiliency of the tribal nations and recognize the historical contexts that have, have and continue to affect American Indians, we recognize that we are visitors and hope to become gracious guests and that honor indigenous past, present, and future. We also explicitly recognize that this acknowledgement is only a small step in assuming the responsibilities and obligations of being settlers in this land that, included re that includes research, reflection, and developing relationships and re of reciprocity with indigenous peoples. Through our teaching, research, and outreach and endeavors, we commit to justice in all its forms, including working to deconstruct false colonial ideologies of the superiority and privilege of Western thought and approaches. The work we need to accomplish towards reconciliation, reconciliation with indigenous peoples is a long-term journey, and we will constantly evolve in the School of Environment and Natural Resources. There are many ways to learn more about tribal connections to the land we find ourselves on, the dispossession of lands and removal of indigenous peoples, and ways to connect with tribal partners in efforts that remove beyond land acknowledgement. Our school is organizing resources and activities to develop reciprocity and connections with indigenous peoples and tribal tribes positively. To learn more, I encourage you to look at the resource um, um, documents that we have at your table that we've compiled on behalf of the EPN. The QR codes will take you directly to university sites and programs where you can learn about Indigenous Peoples Day, Native American Heritage Month, and more. The EPN hosted a few programs last year exploring Indigenous knowledge and emerging sustainability and management frameworks that blend this knowledge and scientific research. In November, which is Native American Heritage Month, the EPN will interview Dr. Michael Charles, a chemical and biomolecular engineer and American Indian sustainability scientist from the Navajo Nation as part of a unique virtual only feature. Dr. Charles, as a representative of the Indigenous Peoples Caucus, will be attending the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference in the United Kingdom on behalf of several tribal organizations. He will participate in an interview documenting his experience and takeaways from the Global Climate Change Conference with the EPN when he returns to Columbus in mid-November. Join us next month or follow the EPN on YouTube to make sure that you don't miss that feature. Broadening participation in environmental science is critical for successful natural resource management. As such, the school led by Dr. Majeka Sullivan of, and the Olentangy River, River, <laughs> River Wetland Research Park take part in the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, a National Science Foundation bridge program aimed at increasing underrepresented minorities in science, technology, engineering, and math degrees. Moving into today's program, as Joe acknowledged, as, as we'd like to acknowledge the Dr. Michelle Corley, Dean of the Central States College of Engineering, Science, Technology, and Agriculture, and Director of Land Grant Programs, had a conflict in MERGE and will not be able to join us today. We had in works several additional collaborations involving Central State University students joining us in person today, but challenges due to COVID got in the way. We hope to re-engage on those plans and collaborate with them on future programs. We are so fortunate to have such an extensive and exciting panel organized for you today. I argue for this biography biography for this morning's host and facilitator, Yolanda Owens, is included in the brochure, along with bios for each of today's speakers. I want to give a special thanks to Kathy Lechman and the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences, Office of Diversity and Equity and Inclusion, for their support and sponsorship of today's EPN activities and helping to ensure that students join us and ate breakfast for free today. I'm so excited to learn more from today's panel of speakers about the future of agriculture and building connections with the land. Now please join me in welcoming a you, Ms. Yolanda Owens, Chief Cultivator, 
Black and president of our college's Alumni Society Board and today's host. Welcome, Yolanda. Good morning. Awesome. Um, first, I want to, uh, to thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, first, I want to thank Kanisha and Mama Osi for making it here from uh, Western Ohio. I want to thank our educators and connectors, Ariella Brown and Dr. Sharp, as well as thanking Dean Kress and also our friends, although they could not make it here, from Central State SESTA. Uh, Ohio's two land-grant universities. Uh, and also thank you to attendees here in person as well as those who are tuning in virtually. Uh, thank you also to Dr. Campbell and to Cecil and the whole EPN for hosting this conversation. In light of Indigenous Peoples Day, which is also every day, I want to be sure to give reverence to the land in which I inhabit as both a descendant of those whose lands were stolen as, as well as those who were stolen. I inhabit the lands of the Adena, the Hopewell, the Kashakia, and Shawnee people. And to that I say, Ashe. My name is Yolanda Owens, and I am the chief cultivator of Forge and Black. Uh, Forge and Black is a consulting and apparel company that is at the intersection of black culture and green thumbs. I am also the sitting president, as Dr. Sharp said, of the CFAES Alumni Society Board, the first woman of color to do so. It is part of my mission to make sure that I'm not the last. <laughs> I am also a proud homegrown Buckeye. I was born and raised right here in Central Ohio. I tried to make it out several times, <laughs> but OSU gave me the best scholarships and the best friends and then a husband who loves Central Ohio. So here I am. <laughs> I graduated with my undergraduate degree in agricultural communications, and I specialize in international economic and social development. Um, through COVID-related job loss, I had the amazing privilege to deliver a TED Talk on the need for agricultural education in, urban, in the urban classroom to engage black and brown youth in Ohio's number one industry, which is agriculture as well as work with amazing organizations such as Kivera Coalition in New Mexico on their annual Regenerative Agriculture Conference, Feed Nova Scotia Food Banking System in Nova Scotia Province, and the National Farm to School Network. All of this work was based on shifting these organizations to hold equity at the center of their work. As COVID has, spared, excuse me, as COVID has shed more light on the inequities in our systems, folks has all, have also been shifting to try to make change. As intersectional people, we all have varying levels of privilege. You are not inherently wrong because you have that privilege, but when you know that privilege exists and you continue to live and do nothing about it is what is the problem. And this is why it is so important to have today's conversation. So without further ado, I wanna turn it over to our panel and allow them to introduce themselves and share a bit about their work. First, we will hear from our farmer friends, Kanisha Robinson, O.C. Deboiku, lovingly known as Mama O.C., followed by Ariella Brown and Dean Kress, after which we will have a question and answer session. said you first, then I listen to my elders. Yes, absolutely. Okay. 
Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Kanisha Robinson, and I am um, I'm a second year farmer. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, how I get got started and what I'm doing now. Um, so I grew up in uh, Southwest Ohio in the Dayton area. Um, my family actually has an eight acre property that um, I knew as a farm when I was growing up. Um, my dad raised hogs and grew most of the food that we um, that we ate. So um, when when I was younger, um, farming wasn't something that I was interested in. Um, my parents actually didn't really want me to farm. Um, in when they were growing up, they grew up in a time where people farmed because they had because they needed to feed their family. If they wanted to be able to feed their family, then they needed to grow their own food. So um, that's that's the way that my parents looked at it. Um, so they wanted me to have the opportunity to get an education and get a good job. <laughs> so um, that's what I did. I went to college, moved away, um, you know, did different jobs for a while. Moved back to the area in 2015 um, when my dad uh, took ill, uh, and then he passed away in 2016. So uh, still at that time, I wasn't even thinking about farming. Um, it wasn't until 2019 when a friend of mine who had been growing in her backyard um, posted on Facebook that she was interested in expanding her um, gardening skills in hopes of serving the community. She wanted to be able to grow food for um, a couple communities in our Dayton area that are now considered as food deserts or food insecure. So all of the big grocery stores had moved out of the area and people just didn't have um, access to fresh food in, you know, in their own community. They had to go outside of their community. So um, I said, well, you know, we have this land here that we're not doing anything with. So, you know, why don't you come out and, and use this? And so, and I told her I would help her. Um, so 2000, uh, 2020, we actually started growing. Um, that was the first year. Neither one of us knew what we were doing, especially me, because I had never grown in my life. Um, and, but we said, okay, we're gonna buy some seeds, we're gonna throw them in the ground and see what happens. <laughs> so that's literally what happened. Um, so there were so many challenges, so many mistakes that we made that first year. Um, but again, as I was do starting with it, I still had no intention of becoming a farmer. Um, it wasn't until, you know, we put in a lot of hard work, a lot of manual labor, um, but we started seeing the fruits of our labor. We started seeing those tiny little seeds sprout up out of the ground and then grow into, you know, big um, plants and then start fruiting. Um, and we did pretty well that first year, um, we decided to just grow a diverse um, uh, variety of fruits and vegetables that first year. Did a good job. But at some point um, during that summer, um, as we were working, I started really, I don't know, I, I like to say that it was probably my dad's spirit or something, but um, that kind of I don't know, encourage me, because I'm, I'm not, I wasn't really an outdoors person. I didn't like bugs and spiders and all that <laughs> type of stuff. But all of a sudden, I just got this, I don't know, inspiration that, uh, to, you know, really connect with the land that I grew up on and kind of continue uh, the legacy that my dad had, had started. And so um, at that point, I decided I would love to do this full time. Um, so then I started volunteering on a farm. And through that connection, um, I met the uh, director of Agraria Center for Regenerative Practices. And um, through that, they uh, had a grant opportunity to start a regenerative farmer fellowship. And I was invited to participate in that program. So it all came at the perfect time. Um, and that's one of the things we'll talk about later um, uh, in the panel discussion is that, um, you know, before that, things like that didn't, I didn't know about them. I don't know if they really existed in this area, um, but that was one of the things that came along for me. So at this time, I'm actually uh, the program assistant for the Regenerative, Farm, uh, Regenerative Farmer Fellowship, 
uh, at Agraria Center for Re Regenerative Practice. Um, it is a 25-week program. It started in April, and we just finished last week. So um, uh, through that program, um, I was also a participant in the program as well as um, the program assistant, so I helped develop some of our uh, workshops that we did. We did weekly workshops and visited different farms, made connections with farmers, um, learned be, uh, all this sort of core curriculum that a, or core topics and skills that a beginning farmer um, would need to know. And so um, through all that, um, now I'm here today to share some of the things that um, I went through as a beginning farmer and um, what my idea of black farming is and how um, we can move forward with that. Okay, thank you. And I'll now pass it on to uh, OC. It's so good to be with you this morning. Thanks for your gracious hospitality and letting us wake up here in Columbus this morning as opposed to getting up at four to get here on time. In the spirit of transparency, since everybody's confessing, I have one to make also. I am an American of mixed ancestry. You don't know who I am till you hear my story. And part of my story is that I started my intellectual and academic career here at when it was still a little t, Ohio State University. <laughs> and I spent two years here and successfully departed before they asked me to leave. It is a wonderment at how the universe works to be back here today after 50 some odd years <laughs> positioning myself as a so-called expert. I find it quite humorous. <laughs> and I know my ancestors are laughing. I have to, today I decided to write because as a storyteller, I could fill up this whole period of time with entertaining dialogue, but I'm limited, so I decided to put this down on paper and then in the conversation, we can talk a little more. My path to now started in Ironton, Lawrence County, Ohio, in north central Appalachia, along the river bordered by West Virginia and Kentucky. I've had an affinity for growing food all the life I can remember. As a small child, I had three unfenced family properties to roam. My mother told me the first time she lost me, I was found in my great aunt's garden slurping on strawberries, oblivious to the flies and bees, hill climbing, crawdad catching, stargazing, and preparing our backyard garden were childhood joys. As an adult, I lived in Cincinnati for over 30 years, growing a reputation as a wordsmith, storyteller, and actor. With great hesitancy, I moved to Dayton in 2012 and was told that I would work on food issues. I thought, I'm, I thought that meant I would work on my own body, pudgy after late childbearing and late night meals. But the COVID-19 quarantine made the move make I wondered what I would regret not having done if the Rona caught me. Hmm. My childhood dreams had manifested, traveling abroad, performing, my name up in lights and in print. Then the revelation came. There were no regrets, but the future needed me. I needed to teach others how to grow food, particularly those who grew up on concrete. Once acknowledged, the universe began to spin and made manifest my destiny. Within 48 hours, I was asked to create a community garden of one of Dayton's most financially challenged neighborhoods. While there, a fellow elder visited and invited me to visit the Edgemont Solar Garden, which was founded in 1978 by the children of Southern migrants who had come to Dayton for the security of an industrial wage. That generation had retained their agricultural knowledge However, as those folks passed away, so did the ancestral wisdom about food systems. Mm -hmm. living, on, living on an abandoned industrial landscape, Edgemont residents face serious health disparities, many that could be addressed with dietary changes, but living in a nationally recognized food desert makes obtaining healthy, affordable produce nearly impossible. I accepted the invitation to join the board of Greater Edgemont Community Coalition thinking I would support the reclamation of the greenhouse and neighborhood garden program, 
but the universe had more in store. Through bumps and twists, I became the farm manager and the site liaison for Central State Extension Services Farm Incubation Program. Then an opportunity came through a fellowship with the Agraria Center for Regenerative Practice, which honors the agricultural practices of my Appalachian heritage. I am growing as an elder on a mission as Edgemont gains public recognition as an urban agriculture program. We now nurture neighbors who need garden space, sponsor new farmers, and hold a bi-weekly farmer's market. Deliberate progress in our food insecurity initiative. During the pandemic quarantine, I called Edgemont Sunday volunteer time, which started at the holy hour of 11, <laughs> the Church of Dirt, inspired by a poem written during my first date in summer when I was growing food around the bricks of my apartment patio. It appears on the next page. I wrote this for um, a journal that will be coming out, and I'll send it uh, a, a tag so that you guys can follow it, but here's the poem. It was uh, written in 2012, I revised it in 2021, because the language has changed. And if I read it the way it was originally, you guys would say, that's a little outdated. <laughs> so I had to get current. <laughs> Made prayer with the earth this morning and turned soil as penance to call upon spring. The snow-fed soil gave easily to the shovel as the clods revealed fresh meat for the winged ones who visit me daily. The coffee can, chock full of composted scraps, was dumped and covered with the petition for a good crop of whatever would be planted there. A plan to cover the poison ivy vine with clematis and roses emerged to eye and nose, futuristic sensory camouflage. Two stray bulbs sang their identities and said where they wanted to go, as four V's of geese, eight in each, announced their journey. No further north no further than the lake north of where I dwell. So, how do you like Dayton? Is a common repeating question for those who know I sat in one place for over 30 years. I look at them trying to figure out what they really want to know. Just what are they asking me? There are libraries here, art museums and exhibits, gatherings for poetry and theater, families cooking out in the park. I'm sure there are barbs with bars with babes and dudes posturing for digits and following friends on social media, hoping sparks will fly and loneliness will flee. It is, for some after all, a shrunken town of abandoned houses, indebted students, military veterans, and frustrated workers who were gainfully employed until Mr. Charlie took his man and ran for the border. But if an answer is necessary, I guess I like it here. As long as I can worship while digging in dirt, my soul is happy, my ancestors are smiling, and so am I. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ariella Brown, and I am really excited to be here with you all. Um, it's going to be very difficult to follow Kanisha and um, Mama. Uh, you can say it any way it comes out your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Mama Omope. Um, but I, I really am. I am not a grower. I do not have a green thumb. But I really feel like I am just a connector. I've always had a passion for agriculture. My story, I guess, started when I worked for Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, who is now the secretary of HUD. And I was her agriculture staffer. And I worked in her district office. And I did a lot of the groundwork um, in Cleveland who, where we um, started a program called the Cleveland Seasonal High Tunnel Initiative where she had this vision of wanting to construct 100 hoop houses or temporary greenhouse structures throughout the city of Cleveland or throughout her district. And so I was really the person that spearheaded that initiative. Fast forward a couple of years, um, my husband is actually a native of Dayton. He said, Ariella, I can't do another Cleveland winter. And so I said, okay. So we moved to Dayton and um, I, 
similar to Kanisha, I uh, was connected to the executive director of um, Regenerative Center for pra what it, Practice. The name recently changed, so I do apologize <laughs> if I get that wrong. Um, Susan Jennings, and at that time, she was actually in the process of working with one of my, my colleague, Dr. Kevin Magruder, um, at Antioch College to um, work on the first black farming conference in Southwest Ohio. And we had a conversation. She said, Ariella, you should, you know, join our committee. And I said, okay. And um, she and I and Dr. Magruder, as well as Ms. Cheryl Smith, who is a community activist in the Yellow Springs and Dayton area, got together. And really, it um, we just started having conversations and we formed a committee and that's kind of how the black farming conference really started and got off the ground. Um, we really didn't know where this was going to take off. In the fall of 2019 is when we started to meet. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. And we we're really planning on to doing something that was going to be in person. And we thought, okay, well, what are we going to do? We're going to have to scramble because now everyone, you know, can't be in closed spaces or proximity. And we decided, okay, well, we're still going to move ahead and do this conference because it really does mean so much. And I feel like there was really a shift where people really wanted to go back to the land. And there were just so many people that were, um, Going, going to do like backyard gardening because really the only thing that you could do was go outside and be, be in your home. And so we said, okay, we're going to make this an online event. And at first we thought it was going to be a challenge, but it was really an opportunity because we were able to reach so many more people than we initially thought that we were. And so we had over 1,200 people actually register for our first year conference. And we again, didn't really know what to expect. Um, we had asked a few people that we actually knew in the community to, you know, serve as speakers, and it was really a, a successful event, and so we said, okay, well, we're maybe on to something, and I'll talk a little bit later, but one of the things that came out of this conference was people said, oh, that was really well organized, you know, would you consider expanding this into something more than just a conference. And so I'll stop there, um, but I'm really excited to be here with you all this morning, and thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Kathy Ann Kress, and I have the distinct privilege to serve as Vice President for Agricultural Administration and Dean of the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences, of which the School of Environment and Natural Resources is part. Uh, I was thinking this morning uh, how lovely it was to sit and start a morning reflecting and listening to stories My typical mornings are often go, 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 do, 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 check things off a to-do list. So thank you uh, for allowing us to start the morning in that way. I want to talk in just a second about the college and what role we think we play here. But uh, as I listened to the stories, I thought it might be helpful to know a little bit about me as well. Um, I grew up actually overseas. I uh, didn't see the United States for most of my childhood. And so my first exposure to agriculture was uh, actually in Lebanon, uh, and then Liberia, then Syria, then Israel, and then Brazil. Uh, when I did make it to the United States, I went to live with a Mennonite family in Iowa hmm. on a farm. Yeah, a little culture shock there, <laughs> just <laughs> teensy bit. Uh, and I came in February to Iowa from Brazil, so I'll let that one rest on you for a little bit. Um, what I learned, though, in all of those uh, places that were my home, and then also very much so 
with the Mennonite family who raised me was that agriculture was the ultimate work, that it was the work of feeding people. It was the work of caring for the land. And it was the work of, through that, caring for other living beings. So I farmed for a while in my career and then found myself in education because it was important to me to serve beyond just what I could do as a farmer and think about what we could do together. What I'm really proud of in this college that I'm now part of is that I think this college really does understand through our people that what we're really doing here is about systems. And when you start to think in systems, I think you think very differently about everything that you're trying to be a part of. And you recognize all those strings that go out and have unintended consequences. And so we try to be mindful of that in the work that we do. We also recognize that our systems mean that there's all kinds of tension around everything we do. And so whether those tensions and opportunities exist between rural and urban, whether they exist between all the different people, whether they exist between organic and production agriculture, there's tensions and opportunities pretty much in every system that we might touch. And sometimes we do okay with that, sometimes we really don't. What we talk a lot about in the college is can we be directionally correct, right? Can we keep improving? Can we learn and can we keep moving in a direction that works? And so that's true whether we're talking about our basic science, it's true whether we're talking about our applied science, and it's true about our education and our outreach efforts as well. I'm really very proud that in our college we were able to convince Assistant Dean Dr. Kathy Leckman to come back and join us. And one of the things that I so appreciate about Dr. Leckman is as she has led our work around diversity, equity, and inclusion, she has been committed along with me that this isn't a program that we do that then we get to kind of tick that box and say, here's the program. Instead, we kind of roll back the carpet, if you will, and we take a look at what's the very foundation of what we're doing as a college and what are the small things we do every day that have to change, that have to be different, so that we can have as many people join us as possible in this ultimate work that we do. There are simply not enough of us who are who understand what it takes and who are committed to it. We need everyone. We need every voice. We need every hand. We need every brain. And so I'm really pleased to be able to be here today. I want to thank Dr. Sharp and Joe uh, for hosting this and allowing us a chance to reflect and learn from one another. I'd be happy to talk about some of those programs that we're doing in a little bit, but I just wanted to start with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Kress. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean Kress. Um, before we get to our question and answer session, what I do want to, to do is take some time because um, Ariella has a really great video to share to show a little bit about the experiences of this year's uh, Black Farmers Conference uh, and some of the hands-on things that we were able to do in person. So this year we were able to do a little bit of in-person as well as virtual. Engage with us. Consider us being the hub, you as our stakeholders, and that we are here at Central State University in Chester to help you. So what we did was run a couple, 120 seeds each um, through the machine. So the machine could hit heat and light at the same time, but we had a control. So we did soybean and corn. We uh, took drone pictures 
of each row and uh, each of basically each individual plot is uh, an image is taken and cropped out of it. Uh, so it can be sent through an algorithm to sort of train um, a, a computer to recognize the phenotype of each um, different type of sweet potato. Rain from hemp is phenomenal um, as far as its nutrient profile goes. Um, it is one of the few plant proteins that has all of the essential amino acids. So a lot of people think of soy as kind of the only one that has all of the essential amino acids that humans need to be healthy. But hemp, in fact, has all of those as well. Genetic variations that have been collected from throughout North America, South America, Central America, and uh, some of the other countries where they grow a lot of, they've been growing a lot of corn ever since Columbus came here. So corn is a new world plant. It never grew in Asia or Africa. Uh, one of the ways to monitor soil health is monitoring soil carbon. And soil carbon through these, uh, best management practices such as color crop, it's gonna take some time, it's not gonna, we're not gonna see immediate results. So I'm setting up these plots for long-term monitoring of soil health, soil carbon. And it's a closed loop system uh, where the water just keeps filtering through the biofilter, the roots of the plants, uh, and then by the time it gets down to the end of the tank, it's clean it up and go back to the fish tank. So that all that, it just keeps running back with all day long. Thank you. If you wear glasses or contacts, you must see this. Sorry, me too. They got to make their money some way. <laughs> <clears throat> so next, um, we want to move into the place of being able to have our question and answer. Um, so if you want to go ahead and pull off the microphone just so you'll be ready, if that's OK. And folks, I think that this is, while you all are stewing, um, I know that there was a link that was placed on the screen earlier for you to be able to put things into the chat uh, for folks who are, who are attending virtually um, and then folks who are in person. Um, it's, like, it's like Dr. Campbell will handle that. We got a microphone right over here. Okay. So I think this applies to everyone. I can share a little, I'll share a little bit about mine and then I will open it up for all of you. But I want to know what is the moment that you knew that this work, and when I say this work, I mean agricultural-based work, is what you were meant to do. And so um, for me personally, I, like I said, I grew up here in central Ohio, and my father's family is from North Carolina. And my father's family was able, they actually inherited land from my great-grandfather who was who was a slave uh, when he was freed he actually was given land by the family that held him and so with that land we were able to farm and that was kind of my first experience and my first parlay into the space of agriculture and seeing a greenhouse and a smokehouse and a garden and doing work with my grandmother and um, when my grandmother developed alzheimer's what we did here in Columbus was to, we grew a garden in our backyard on the south side of Columbus. I grew up in Southfield. And so um, back in our backyard, we grew everything from zucchini, uh, tomatoes, onions, beans. And I remember walking home from school and my after school snack would be me going in the backyard to our garden and picking tomatoes or picking a zucchini and sauteing it in the pan. Like that's, that was normal for me. And I also remember, um, being connected when I was little, we used to belong to a food co-op, and I used to be really embarrassed about that uh, because we got our food in a, in a box. My friends went to Kroger at the time. They went to Big Bear. That tells you how old I am. They went to Big Bear. Um, they went to cool places. Like they went to the grocery store, and we picked up our stuff in a box. And I was like, why don't we get our stuff in a box? This is weird. Not knowing how amazing and forward-thinking that my that was here in Columbus. Um, it was based off of Livingston Avenue near Fairwood. Um, 
So that, that's kind of the connection that I had, and as well as traveling abroad to Ghana and seeing the inequities and seeing this space of um, amazing resources, but the fact that these resources, when exported, when they came back into the country, were so expensive that the people that lived in that country could no longer afford them. To know that I'm in Ghana and this is where they grow cocoa, but the people that lived in Ghana could afford to purchase a chocolate bar. That broke my heart, and that's actually what, what helped me to tran transfer into the College of Agriculture. Specifically, when I came back from my second trip to Ghana, I transitioned and I transferred. Um, thankful for Manners, Manners um, our Manners advisor who harassed me a ton. And, um, but after that trip, she knew that I had went. And she, after that trip, she connected me. And she even gave me an advisor from Ghana. How amazing is that, right? And that was like, that was when I knew, I was like, this is the work that I need to be doing to be able to fix these inequities in our food system for people that look like me, right? So I know that was a lot, <laughs> I was like, and it was full, right? But if there is a, a moment in time or, or that you knew that this was where you meant you were supposed to be or the work that you're supposed to be doing. It's like, I know you have a story, Mama O.C. <laughs> when, no. Well, let's start here. Both sides of my family came to Ohio in the early 1920s. My father's people were agriculturalists out of Appomattox County, Virginia. My mother's people come from the borderlands and the farming valleys between the Smokies and the borderlands of Kentucky, I mean, of northern Georgia and southern Tennessee. So I ate well all my life. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I wrote a poem about basements filled with jars of sunshine, talking about the cellars and where, where food was stored. So it was common in our house to have fresh peach pie on New Year's Day because we'd done sliced up bushels during the summer and either canned them and then Mama got that big freezer that she could stick three or four children in. <laughs> and uh, then we really had food. We had half a cows and stuff like that. So my father's people made a deliberate decision and were recruited by the CNO Railroad to come because they were iron workers for generations. Uh, the earliest known ancestor in that lineage is a blacksmith. And yet my mother's people owned their land. And I don't know how they got the land, but since my great grandmother had ancestors who were classified as white, it's highly likely she was given some land by her grandfather. Yeah. But they lost that land from jealousy, uh, impressed liens, high prices for fertilizer and seed. And the culmination story that my grandfather told me was before they left their land, they had gone in to sell their cotton. Yeah, they grew their own cotton on their own land. It's a little, something to be a little bit jealous of, I suspect. And um, my grandfather had been to school. My great-grandfather made sure all his kids got as much education as they could, given the time. And my grandfather disrespectfully corrected the warehouse master about his math, which he was doing with a paper and a pencil. My grandfather was doing it in his head. Needless to say, he stepped across the boundary that he refused to recognize. And they were told to put the cotton back on the wagon or sell it for the price that was quoted, which would have been a loss. Now, you know, for a penny, they could have had some child run down the warehouse row and tell them not to buy the Ellis cotton. So they put that cotton back on the wagon. I mean, they sold the cotton. They got back in the wagon, and they went home. My great-grandmother was a midwife, and she had delivered many children in that county. And the story that my grandfather told me was that there was a knock on the door in the middle of the night. Little old lady from across the creek. Y'all know what that euphemism means, right? Across the creek, across the tracks, across whatever the boundary is. Came and told her she'd better get her son John out of the state of Georgia because the patty rollers were looking for him. They were going to hang him for impudence. And my family walked off their land with the medicine bags. They were both medicine people. The spinning wheel the sewing machine, which is in my house, in order to save my grandfather's life. It wasn't until the Rona came. Y'all know when I say the Rona. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the ghetto speak for COVID-19. I was in my house, you know, just me and the walls. 
And I went, you know what? If I keep sitting here, I'm going to gain 40 pounds. And I'm going to de be depressed. I got to get out of this house and do something. I'm a, I'm a community activist, kind of low-key, right? And uh, y'all heard in the story that it was a confession that I made to the spirit world in which I entirely believe in. You're entitled to believe in what you believe, and I am entitled to believe in what works for me. And it worked for me. And I was cathartic about being locked up in the house. And what could I do? And the I mean, it was like thunderstorm. Boom. This is what you got to do. Remember we told you to go to Dayton and we told you we're going to work on food? Well, this is the gate and you've got to walk through this gate because the future needs you. That made absolutely no sense until I met people my age who didn't know how to grow anything. When I, anything. Not a pothos, not an African violet not grass. They didn't know how to grow anything. And I was totally dismayed. And as I get ready to leave the 60s and go into my 70th decade, it instantly I knew what I had to do if I was going to leave this world empty, if I was going to give everything that was possible to give so that I could fulfill my destiny, I had to teach people something as simplistic as how to grow food. So that's where I'm at. The issue that I know is we're a people who were stolen because we were experts at agriculture. And here we are, 300 years later, we fed the nation as it grew from sea to shining sea, and now we can't feed ourselves? That's an abomination. So I'm thinking about the, um, the moment that I realized that this was the work I was supposed to do. So I, I kind of talked about it when I introduced myself, but um, my story is similar to yours, Yolanda. Um, since growing up on a farm where my, in my daily thing that we ate, um, I was actually embarrassed by that <laughs> um, because none of my friends lived on a farm. Um, none of my, everybody went to the grocery store. And I remember asking my parents, why can't we just go to the grocery store like everybody, everybody else? Um, at that time, I had no idea what privilege that was, you know, to grow, the, grow our own food. Um, he literally grow, grew everything, all types of fruits and vegetables. Um, there's trees planted uh, that we still see, you know, and we still reap the benefits of today that he planted years ago. So uh, when I started um, growing last year, um, there was just this, well, last year, meaning with the pandemic hitting, uh, there was a moment where I was, I thought, like, when the pandemic hit and there were all these shortages, I thought how necessary and important it would be for people. Everybody, I think everybody needs to learn how to grow their own food. And so because of that, that's where I had that sort of moment that I was like, I, I need to do this. And then, you know, I want to be educate other people on the necessity of, of do, growing your own food. I mean, we all have experienced it. We read articles. We know it, that, you know, the food at the grocery store is not necessarily the best. Um, even if it's organically grown, it might have been grown in California and took several miles to get here. Um, there's nothing like growing food in your own backyard. Um, it, I didn't realize that until uh, I was on my own for the first time. Went to the grocery store and bought, you know, a tomato. And there was a distinct difference um, mm -hmm. in the taste. And at that point, I kind of realized, like, wow, it was bland. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> well, it was very, Probably very bland, bland and tasteless. <laughs> But I mean, just you know, growing something in your own backyard, how much more delicious it is. Um, and then knowing exactly where it came from, what you did to it, you know, the quality of your soil, you know, all that was very important to me. So, yes, I meant, as OC said, a manifestation from from our own hands. Yes. 
So, um, so last year during the pandemic, that was my moment. Anyone else? Like you don't all have to share. If you want to share. If anyone else wants to share. Looks like we do have a, I think we have a question. Did you, you have a question? Absolutely. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having this panel and conversation. It's very important. My name is Orlando Hunter. I am a MFA grad student in dance. Um, and Mama Osi, I see that you are an artist. So I just want to know how you see art as being part of this movement for black farmers and, and gardeners to have justice, to create awareness. See, this is how the universe plays tricks on me. There's a dance major in here to a food workshop. I don't need that. Do I need this? Yes. Somebody yeah. says yes. So I conform. I will conform. Yes, ma'am. Seriously, um, I had a conversation with one of the undergrads out there, and she was talking about uh, urban farming as community development. And... You know, people who, are, who want more money put an A in the middle of STEM and say STEAM. But there's nothing, forgive me for all these PhD individuals and candidates for higher degrees. There is nothing more essential to the human expression than the opportunity to be creative. You can call that art if you have to. But creativity is essential to the expansion of the human consciousness. Because if we... And, and, and just call it documentation if you don't like the word art. Mm. You know, if we could use creative ways to document the things, I think the battery is failing in this. If we could find creative ways to engage each other in conversation, if we can find creative ways to document the impact of our work, if we could find creative ways to disassemble the boundaries that keep us from functioning as a unified human unit, then we could, we could solve some problems, right? Um, so for me, the first thing we did, that I did at the solar garden with the neighborhood to help them understand that I was working this as a community development civic engagement was we did a, a, an event on the land called Pandemic Prescriptions. Mm. I invited other artists, spoken word artists, uh, musicians, and others who were interested in growing food on our land to come and, and create community together. And it was such a wonderful thing. We did a reverse offering. We gave away basil, which was in a big jar on the stage. It was kind of like an altar, but was nobody supposed to know that? You know? <laughs> and as people left, we gave them bags of the extra commodity stuff that had been given away. So everybody left with basil and raisins and onions and all that kind of stuff. The thing that was great, we had, it was Kalimba, Marim, um, Kalimba Thumb Piano. Mm -hmm. And we had a, an old buddy of mine from my days at the University of Cincinnati showed up again in my life. And he played for us while we sat in the glowing rays of a setting sun, claiming what our intention was for that land, right? That was in September. Mm -hmm. In April, we had farmers on the land through Central State. That's the power of creativity. The people in there who thought that it was gonna be so hard to reinvigorate the greenhouse and the land saw that through the commonality of art, a creative expression, that we could gather enough energy, synergy, to change our own circumstance. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking. Thank you. That's amazing, yes. You make it really difficult to follow you, Mama O.C. It doesn't matter what anybody says. <laughs> it's okay. It'll be your turn one day. <laughs> Lord willing, absolutely. Um, that, was, that was amazing. And, I, I, and it's so true to be able to, the, the space of, of documenting, and I think that's, that's part of the disconnect with our community and agriculture is a space of documentation or, or the inability to be able to document because that was taken away from us, right? And I think that that is that's if we're able to continue that, then we won't have this problem in the future, right? Um, with that said, what are some of the things 
Oh, we have another. Oh, we have another question. Okay, absolutely. My questions are only filler questions, so I want to I want to be able to answer the questions of the folks who are in the room, because my questions can be answered. They can be shared out virtually. They can. I want to make sure that I can capture what is here in this moment right now. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much to our speakers. Um, my name is Zoe Placius. I'm an agricultural economist and a faculty member um, here in the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences. And uh, I did have the opportunity to be one of the 1,200 people who participated in the Black Farming Conference last year. So thank you um, for, for putting that together. I'm sorry, I can't see you right there behind the podium. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things that, that has kind of occurred to me in the way that we are doing our, our work and our outreach here um, is that sometimes when we say farmers, um, when folks hear that, Maybe if you're a black farmer, you don't hear yourself, even if it, we say farmers, you don't see yourself reflected in the group of farmers that you think that is, a, is applying to, right? And mm -hmm. the reason we have a black farmer conference, as I understand it, right, is because there's a lot of people who feel disenfranchised from farm resources and resources that are intended for, for farmers. So as a faculty member at Ohio State, I'm really interested in what would you like to see us doing um, to broaden that tent to really live up to the, the vision that I think Dean Kress shared earlier? Because saying it is one thing and really bringing it, <laughs> bringing it home and, and bringing people in under that, under that tent. And when, when we say farmers, making everyone feel like they're, they're one of those people that's included in that because we're offering things to them that speak to them and to their needs. I'd just love to hear any of the thoughts that you have about what we could be doing um, here at the university to help build that, those creative spaces that you were just talked about. And that's, a, that's a great question. And I would say that's something that I'm still trying to um, figure out, but I think it's important to really provide numbers, especially to young people, and to let them know that there is money in agriculture. Um, I mean, I think Yolanda said earlier, agriculture is the number one driver in the state of Ohio. I think it's uh, one in seven or one in eight jobs can be attributed to agriculture in the state of Ohio. And so um, I think a lot of young people think that when you hear farming, it's all about just getting your hands dirty, but that's definitely not the case. There's so much diversity in agriculture. Um, so I would say that that's number one, just really um, showcasing the depth of the diversity of agriculture and how, how much money there actually is in agriculture, to be just quite frank. Um, one of the things that I tried to do when we, that I did or spearheaded when, we were, when I worked for the Congresswoman was we did an event, it was, um, it was a career fair. It was an 1890 land grant career fair that was literally centered around agriculture to give students an opportunity. And it was geared toward high school students throughout her entire district. And it was really an opportunity for the colleges to say, these are opportunities in agriculture that go beyond um, just getting your hands dirty. Even though there's a lot of you know students or young people that want to get their hands dirty, there's also people who don't want to do that. Um, and so I think really just providing those numbers and that information is really important. I know also the Ohio Farm Bureau has a program um, that's specifically geared towards high school students, and it's a free program where um, you can actually come on to Ohio State's campus as well as Central State's campus for, I believe it's two weeks. And it's literally like a, a free training program, and they show you different aspects of um, agriculture, so not just farming, but different things. And so I think really just showcasing the, the diversification and how much money you can actually make, um, depending on what that is from, you know, food science to um, being a farmer, um, is. I think the word farmer has some uh, long historical assumptions about it. Number one, ER means male. I learned that in the third grade. Everybody growing food, not male. 
everybody growing food ain't growing it like ADM on millions of, I'm exaggerating, millions of acres. I think the word grower is probably more appropriate because you can grow in pots on your windowsill. And if growing your herbs makes you more comfortable about using herbs instead of seasoning salts for your food, then you are a grower. Um, I think farmer can be intimidating. The word farmer can be intimidating because it implies that you've got three, four tractors, a big barn, some cattle, a horse, and some chickens. When you say farmer, if you're saying grower, then you're attached to a food system in some way. And then there are other things in agriculture besides growing. And what really, we've all skirted around the issue. It's the stereotype that farming somehow or another is a dishonorable act because your fingers are dirty and you don't get a corner office, but some jobs and they do come with transportation, and they do come with opportunities to travel. So I think we need to have a different kind of conversation about what agriculture as a system can offer uh, younger people who are beginning their quest for adulthood. Thank you so much. One thing I, I will add um, that's something that I've try to work toward as well as just the integration and what it looks like for agriculture as a career space to be introduced to younger students. So when kids are even thinking about what do I wanna be when I grow up, it's not just the spaces of doctors and lawyers and police officers, but it is what does it look like, as we say here at CFAES, what does it look like to sustain life because we sustain life. Um, so, my name is Alyssa Gregory, and I'm a social worker with Moms to Be, which is a community outreach program through the medical center. Um, I'm also um, a MCRP and an MCAL student as well. So, my my question to you guys is, how what do we need to do, and how can we empower our moms and families that live in what Franklin County we call the high priority neighborhoods? So, um, it's you know, it's more than just knowing how to grow. It's having the time and, you know, getting getting um, past the trauma and just the time and all of those other things. So how, how do you guys think we can work to empower those women and families to be growers? Back in the, back in the creek. Is that the bad one? Turn it off. It's on. <laughs> there we go. It's got a sweet spot. <laughs> Back in the other century, I worked as a Head Start director. And the early Head Start initiative had just come out for zero to three to infant toddler programs. One of the things that we did was created an interactive parent child garden where the kid tools and the grown ups had big people tools and they planted lettuce and carrots and things that they could then snack on and encourage that. Um, you know the new, all these numbers and letters get all mixed up in my head, but I, what I call the new Biden plan includes introducing nutrition and agriculture at the preschool level. We had a young man come in our offices the other day, he's probably in his early 30s, and he had one of the things I love, I love a, a bean pie. A navy bean pie? Anybody out here know a, navy, a bean pie? So he brought them, <laughs> and he proceeded to give his elders a 40-minute lecture on the value of a navy bean. And I realized while he was speaking that in his disrupted historical learning, he assumed that people of color ate beans because we were poor. We ate beans because we knew beans were a high high source of protein and we ate animal meat only sacrificially and communally and to be able to bring that back to children that beans legumes are not a, a, a poverty food that would be a, a shift in the right direction um so I'm 
actually a new mom, and I actually went to the doctor not too long ago. And one of the things that they just gave me was um, to sign up for Dolly Parton's, like, free library, mm -hmm. which I thought was so cool. Um, and so I think that if you're able to connect with the OSU Extension offices, they have resources um, for different community um, like gardens and different things like that. And so I would, you know, maybe just have a list of resources um, in your clients, like particular um, communities. I think that's very helpful. I'd say nowadays, most communities has some type of community garden where you can go and either um, sign up for a plot or um, get some free produce whatever the case may be, but I would definitely connect with the OSU Extension offices and figure out if there's a way to get resources that you can just hand out. You're up. Hi, I'm Regina Loaiza, and I'm a second year student here in SCNR majoring in environmental policy. Thank you so much to all of you for everything you've said so far. I really appreciated hearing from you. Um, one thing I've noticed, um, just like in the classes I've been taking within SCNR, is that um, a lot of times when we're talking about like agriculture, the environmental movement, um, only like the contributions of white people are mentioned, and not a lot of time. And like I know there are the contributions of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, but they're just not mentioned in the classroom. And recently, actually, like two weeks ago, I held an event with the undergraduate student government where we were mentioning like the contributions of Hispanic and Latina people to the environmental movement. Um, and we had like some panelists and it was a great event, but I was just wondering what suggestions you have for um, going through like, I don't know, history or just acknowledging those contributions, especially since they're not always highlighted in the classroom. I will say th that's a great question. And also, part of the reason why you're, we're here today is that the, we also have, the, you know, we're, we're talking about the struggles overall. Uh, and so I think this is a, is a communal space for us to be able to figure out what it looks like to be able to raise up those names, move out of, of uh, I think sometimes there's a struggle or this balance that I was just talking, um, talking with Heather about. And the recognition of people of color, but not having to have us do the heavy lifting of, of, of informing folks. So, th so there is definitely this balance. Um, go ahead, Mama O.C. You know, <laughs> some, some of you probably watched me recoil when the nice gentleman said, and ever since Columbus, and I was like, Native people were growing food long before Columbus even know where the ocean went. <laughs> you know, and calling things out like that. Mm -hmm. You know, corn is now a universal commodity. And those of us who study just a little bit <laughs> know that it comes out of Mesoamerica. You know, and so calling, calling things out gently so we don't hurt people's feelings, but acknowledging truth where truth is, that's why it's important for people to understand that African people were not stupid and gullible. They were trusting. Slavery was a system, an economic system, but nobody knew it was going to be a multi-generational life sentence when they sold the prisoners of war. And to be able to acknowledge the things that they brought here besides that wisdom in their heads, because you know, to be treated like we don't know how to grow food is a real <laughs> insult. Because, you know, you knew by the third grade, but seed in the ground, give us some water, give us some sun, give us some soil. It's going to grow something. But to approach us like we're devoid of funk, when we the real funk masters, is, you know, give it up to my brothers and sisters, my cousins of Mesoamerica for the corn and cornmeal, because without it, we would not have survived in this here America. to add to that because, you know, this morning, it, it, from my perspective, is also a, a morning about stories and the power of the stories as everyone here is witnessing this morning. And one of the things that I'm concerned about just across the board when we're talking about uh, the environmental 
area when we're talking about agriculture is how many of our stories that we've lost or don't tell. So that if you ask anyone, you know, who, who are the people who've made significant contributions uh, in the area of agriculture or in the area of our environmental movement, what I find is that most people maybe can name one person and they have lost all of the other rich stories that exist. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's powerful for us to revisit and think about all the stories that weave together that are part of these systems that make up how we feed ourselves and care for the land. They're powerful stories and they're interwoven through different cultures, through different times, uh, but they're powerful and yet most of us have no knowledge or understanding of any of these stories of our food and our land at all. Thank you. Thank you, Arjuna. Greetings in the spirit of peace. My name is Sophia. I'm the owner and operator of Ladybug's Farm located on the south side of Youngstown, Ohio. I'm also wearing the cap of Mahoning Food Access Coordinator so I've also been a grower for a decade and I'm so proud to be in this space with you. I'm so grateful for OSU and making these connections for us to move forward. I guess my question to you would be, how is it or how are you engaging the farmers or the growers that are already on the ground doing the actual work as the expert? The challenge with the big educational facilities and the actual people who are doing the work is often because of past experiences and them not considering their information as good or resourceful. I do believe we need to change the slave narrative because not all people of color were slaves. Many of them were indigenous and already here. So we do have to change that language, but how are, are you in this work reflecting the joy, the beauty, the sunshine, the wind, and the bees that many people, not just people of color, never get a chance to experience in small spaces like walkable cities. These are languages that are often keeping people in these spaces like urban areas that are walkable cities out of those places. So how are you engaging the experts, the growers who get these small grants with coop houses and raised beds and 1.3 acres of growing space or just their backyard or their vacant lot how are you engaging them to be proud to say, I am a farmer and I'm reclaiming the work of my ancestors? Mm. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I actually want to answer yours and the young lady's question. Um, so I will say that we are trying to, that's one of the things that we've tried to accomplish through the Black Farming Conference. And I will say, unfortunately, that was for the first year, that was actually, this sounds crazy when I say it, but the farmers were actually an afterthought when we, the first year we planned the conference because no one on the conference is, conference planning committee is actually a grower or a farmer. Um, but we are really passionate about these issues, um, and we knew that we had to, you know, bring this conference to a forefront. Um, anyway, um, to move forward to that, we actually are doing a quarterly roundtable discussions with our um, BIPOC farmers. And so, because we recognize we need to have the experts at the table, because we want to always be intentional about the work that we're doing. And so... The Black Farming Conference really is an opportunity to celebrate our BIPOC farmers, as well as provide resources and a platform for networking. And so that's really what we've tried to do in the, these past two years. Um, and to answer your question earlier, um, so for the conference, two things, that, one of the things that we do is it's a two-day conference. The first day is always going to be centered around the historical aspects and contributions of black and underrepresented farmers, and which is why it's great that we have a historian that's on our committee. 
Uh, last year, we actually had um, the author of The Bone in the Snow of the Land, um, America's Forgotten Black Pioneers. Her name is Dr. Annalisa Cox. Um, I would look up some of her work. And then this year, we had um, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard, who um, wrote the book uh, Collective Courage. And it's, it's more, it's a research work on um, cooperatives, cooperatives, economic cooperatives. And she, she gave a talk on um, black farming cooperatives specifically. So those are just two speakers that you can do some more research on. In class, are you, oh, no, go ahead. I was, she said no. <laughs> um, so I just wanted, I wanted to speak on um, what the Regenerative Farmer Fellowship is doing at Agraria. Um, so there was a grant that Agraria received to do this um, program, and I want to just make sure I mention this before I forget. Uh, it was a collaborative effort between the Nature Conservancy, uh, Central State University, and Agraria. Um, and through this fellowship, um, we are honoring um, regenerative farmers in our area in Southwest Ohio. Um, and we had out, so part of the, our weekly workshops is to do tours of local farms and connect with farmers. And we had uh, two BIPOC um, farms that we actually visited uh, over this 25 weeks, um, just because we, we didn't know of any others. Um, but we're starting to learn <laughs> where they all are. Um, but one of the farms that we, we visited, um, her family uh, has been growing in the Brookville, Ohio area for eight years on that land. But they also have uh, years of experience in growing. And when we went to visit her farm, she was, um, we were so like engaged and interested in the work that we're, they were doing and asked so many questions. And she, she was so, um, maybe shocked, um, thrilled that we were so interested in the work that, that they were doing. Um, this is work that she has loved herself, but she didn't know that there were other people who also loved and appreciated the work that she did. Um, so uh, through our visit, um, some of us, uh, mainly OC, <laughs> encouraged her to start teaching. Um, because she has um, a wealth of information. Um, their farm is actually called the Narrow Way Farm. Uh, it's in Brookville, Ohio. And positions, um, she is coming on to program. All of these things started um, happening for her. And she, um, one of the things that she mentioned was the fact that um, she was just honored, really, that people were interested in the work that they were doing. So uh, that's one of the ways that our program is honoring and reaching out. A conversation around the question of humanity's degree of population. 
on uh, streams and wetlands. Um, my understanding is it's going to be in a sketch comedy routine format, so using the arts to sort of like bring this topic to life. Um, so we look forward to sort of like having you at those future events. Um, thank you very much for all your wonderful energy. Try to make this a zero waste event. Uh, please be attentive to the, the three receptacles.